Good afternoon. <clears throat> Hello, everyone. My name is uh, Bishop Omari. I have the privilege and honor to serve as AGA president. Uh, this is the third uh, uh, president uh, AGA uh, town hall. Uh, uh, we've had uh, so uh, the first two. Uh, one was in uh, July, and that dealt with the AGA equity project. Uh, we had a fantastic turnout for that. The second was in September, and that dealt with uh, advocacy. Uh, this particular topic, uh, dealing with career development, uh, talking about career options, it's really a topic that's near and dear to my heart. And certainly the way that I ended up in my uh, uh, the career path that I've chosen had a lot to do with watching other role models, if you will, uh, the mentoring that I've received. And this is something that, that I've carried uh, with me throughout my, my professional career. And, and I can, the, the kind of the most fun parts of my career is really interacting with uh, trainees whether they're trainees uh, working in the lab or uh, trainees uh, on the floor, on the wards. So um, I was so excited that um, we, uh, we were able to put this together for you and hopefully you'll find it very helpful and very useful. Um, unfortunately, we cannot do this in person, so we'll make the best of it uh, using uh, this uh, web uh, mechanism. So uh, I have Courtney who's gonna be helping uh, uh, proceed with the slide. So Courtney, if you don't mind maybe going uh, to the uh, next slide. So we have an all-star uh, group of uh, panelists uh, here for you. So what we'll do is I'm gonna just uh, briefly introduce each one. And uh, what we've asked each panelist to do is uh, tell us where they've trained uh, and also a little fun fact about them. So in terms of me, I'll start. I trained at UC, I did my GI fellowship at UC San Diego. And maybe one, I don't know if it's a fun fact, it could be an embarrassing fact. Uh, when I <clears throat> applied for, uh, uh, residency. Uh, I went to MD PhD program at that time was University of Miami. It's a two year program. I liked both surgery and internal medicine. I had no clue what I wanted to do. So I applied to both residencies. Uh, and when I put the, the rank, the match, it was uh, a few were medicine, a few uh, were uh, surgery. I was so lucky I landed in internal medicine. I did my residency at UC Irvine. And that's how I ended up, fell in love with GI. And for me, uh, the rest is just uh, uh, a sequence of uh, uh, fortunate uh, events. So we're going to start. Uh, Peter uh, is uh, currently uh, assistant uh, professor uh, at uh, NYU. He also uh, works at the Manhattan uh, VA. Uh, and uh, Peter, maybe you can uh, tell us um, a little bit about yourself. Uh, sure. Thank you so much, Fisher. Uh, so I'm here in uh, my capacity as the chair of the Trainee Early Career Committee. Um, and I trained uh, did my GI fellowship at the University of Washington. And uh, NYU is my first job. So. Um, and I really enjoy it. Um, fun fact about me, I guess uh, I am a new father. Uh, I have a 10 and a half month old, and which has been a really kind of a fun and exciting journey. So. Uh, thanks so much, uh, Peter. Uh, Dr. Kim, Larry Kim. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm a par partner at South Denver Gastroenterology, um, private practice out in, uh, outside of suburban Denver, Colorado. And uh, I trained at UCSF and um, subsequently moved here. And actually, this is my first job. Um, and fun fact, I guess, about Colorado, you know, we take our outdoor pursuits pretty seriously around here. So if you have any friends in the area, ask them about the Colorado trifecta. Mm -hmm. You have to fly fish, ski, and golf all on the same day. That, that sounds great. Uh, uh, next uh, Distinguished uh, panelist is uh, Dr. Michael Weinstein, He's President and CEO of Capital Digestive uh, Care. Uh, Michael. Uh, thank you, Bishop. Does that mean I'm the oldest person here? Um, I went into, so I'm uh, President and CEO of Capital Digestive Care, a uh, 60, 70 physician single specialty group in, in the Washington, D.C. area. Um, Fun fact about me, when I, I trained in Washington, and by the time you're done with your fellowship, often you decide that's where you want to live. And I was lucky enough to join the two busiest physicians in Washington uh, when they were looking for a partner and I was looking for a job. And I, I began my education at, in the business of medicine while I was a fellow. After I had agreed to join them, they sent me down to Knoxville, Tennessee to work with Gene Overholt for a week to learn how to build an ambulatory surgery center. Uh, so I was a fellow and came back to Washington and built the second ambulatory endoscopy center in the United States. That's awesome. Uh, 
Dr. Kim Barrett. Uh, she's a distinguished professor of medicine at UC San Diego. Actually, I was uh, got to know Kim when I did my GI fellowship at UCSD. Uh, among her many hats that she wears, she's also editor-in-chief of the premier physiology journal, Journal of Physiology. Uh, Kim. Yes, so good evening, everybody. Um, I trained at uh, University College London, and also I was a postdoc at the National Institutes of Health. And my job at UCSD is actually my first job too, so I've never left, although I'm currently working at the National Science Foundation for a year or two as a division director. Um, my fun fact is that in my copious spare time, I'm the lead backup singer for a band of GI scientists called GI Distress. Thanks so much. Let me ask you to uh, ask you to maybe sing a song for us or two. Uh, uh, Dr. Lin Chang, uh, she currently is vice chief of uh, GI at UCLA. She's also um, a director of the uh, uh, GI fellowship program. And uh, maybe you can tell us uh, uh, where did you train and a fun fact, uh, Lin. Yeah, so uh, welcome everyone. I'm happy to be here. Uh, I w have been really in Los Angeles uh, all my life except for one year and I trained in my GI fellowship at UCLA. And at that time, there were a lot of all practices were men basically and they wanted a woman and I got recruited to go in private practice. But my husband wanted to do vascular surgery. So we moved to Rochester, Minnesota where in Mayo Clinic, he did his vascular surgery fellowship. And I decided that year that I wanted to go in academia. So uh, I, we came back to Los Angeles and I was on faculty at the county hospital that's associated with UCLA doing GI bleeding, pink bill. Um, and four years into it, I decided I really want a career change. So I applied for a grant, decided to go 180 degrees different and went into functional GI and I moved to UCLA. And so instead of having a, a patient care practice, I really went into research with less uh, patient care. So I made a very circuitous route to my current career. Uh, thanks so much, uh, Lynn. <clears throat> Last but not least is Dr. Nick uh, Davidson. He's the John Adeline uh, Simon uh, Professor of Medicine at uh, Washington University of St. Louis. He's also director of an NIH-funded uh, uh, center and chief of GI. Uh, Nick. Thanks, Bashir, and hi, everyone. Um, so yeah, I'm Nick Davidson. I'm the chief of GI at WashU. Um, uh, my um, medical school education was in England at King's College. Um, I came over to New York um, and um, went through the Clinical Scholars Program at Rockefeller University, um, did my GI fellowship at Columbia. I had no intention of becoming a basic scientist. Um, complete accident. Um, I was lucky enough to have um, good results from preliminary experiments and good mentors who pushed me. Um, and um, I just followed um, a trail of opportunity. And um, to be honest with you, I couldn't have picked St. Louis out of a map. I have no I would have no idea where it was. It's a small city in the middle of the country, but here I am. Um, yeah, so um, following um, a trail of, uh, of opportunity and, and, and great mentorship has, has been my lodestar. Fun fact, um, when I was, um, oh, my first job was at Columbia. Uh, I was a, a, an attending physician at PNS. Um, and during my first job, um, my wife and I lived in a small apartment in Greenwich Village. And for those of you who know New York City, um, Columbia PNS is up at 168th Street and I lived on 10th Street. And so I used to run home uh, down the West Side Highway, um, carrying my few prized possessions and a $20 bill in case I needed to get a cab home um, and ran the New York City Marathon. So that was my training. Uh, good for you. You're making me feel guilty, Nick. But uh, <laughs> I think every one of the participants, uh, uh, certainly your listeners uh, now, each one of uh, you have your own fun facts. I wish we should have the time to listen because, it, you know, it, it's really... Uh, it's quite interesting. We all take different paths, uh, but uh, and we're all uh, you know, either scientists working in the field of GI um, or uh, fellows uh, trying to decide what they want to do with their careers, uh, program directors, might be division chiefs, uh, and so on. So we're going to move through this quickly. Peter, you, you get uh, uh, um, the first goal. One important thing I should mention, uh, thank you, uh, uh, Co uh, Courtney, is that um, it's really, we want to make this as interactive as possible. We tried 
by design to have about 20 or 25 minutes of uh, Q&A session. Uh, so uh, you can submit your questions just on, uh, by clicking on the Q&A and uh, for similar questions, I'll try to pull them together and, and ask direct a question depending on who you would like it to, to go. So uh, next slide, please. Peter. Okay, thank you so much, Fisher. And I just wanna reiterate what Fisher just said that uh, for all our 82 participants and counting, uh, if you have any questions, please type it in. Uh, otherwise I'll have to try to you know, ask, anticipate questions you may have and ask the panelists, which is not, all, uh, not as, uh, as good as uh, others could be. But um, so I wanted to tell you a little bit about our um, training early career committee, which is the um, committee uh, in the AGA that's dedicated, as the name suggests, to trainees, both clinical as well as research uh, trainees, as well as um, those in early phase of their careers, um, clinicians, as well as scientists. Um, and it's composed of a number of uh, committee members who are also um, in, in the other AGA committee. So we, we really have, you know, our um, feelers in all uh, of the committees where, you know, the AGA is doing all these really interesting uh, work and all these interesting programs. And our goal is to um, create programs um, and serve the younger population of the, um, of the association. So um, next slide, please. And I wanna tell you about, especially uh, this new program that we are kicking off uh, soon, next week, in fact, it's the Career Development Workshops. Um, some of you may have heard of uh, the Regional Practice Skills Workshops. Um, this was, these were in-person uh, career development workshops uh, that were held in various cities um, across the US. And uh, we've been doing this for the past five or six years, and it was one of our kind of mo most popular programs. And we had actually um, decided to make this shift to a, a virtual format even before COVID hit. And, and now it's, uh, I think that was uh, anticipatory and, and good anticipation, I, I, I suppose. Um, and we are gonna start off uh, next week with uh, Dr. John Allen. And um, we're gonna talk about how to evaluate a job in 2021. So Dr. Allen actually is gonna be able to talk both about private practice as well as academic practice jobs. And we also have uh, lots of other upcoming, uh, uh, upcoming topics uh, scheduled, um, including how to succeed in academic practice during COVID. And we just confirmed that will be on December uh, 16th. So we're gonna try to do this once per month, followed by how to succeed in private practice, life and industry, communication and medicine and science and other ones that are in development. So please uh, be on the lookout for those. We're gonna try to do it uh, on Wednesdays at 8 p.m. Eastern throughout, um, and we will uh, notify you as um, each uh, workshop is finalized with the dates. Next slide, please. And this is only one of the many programs um, that the Training Early Career Committee um, is uh, involved in. Another, uh, some of the other ones are, are shown here on this slide. Um, I want to point a few out. One is the Young Delegates Program. Um, obviously, the AGA uh, encompasses uh, a lot of members, um, only a small portion of whom um, have the uh, ability to serve on uh, committees. Um, but there are a lot of, um, there's a lot of desire to engage on a more time limited basis. So the Young Delegates Program uh, was started a number of years ago with intention to offer um, shorter um, volunteer opportunities and since since then, we've had you know well over a hundred, I think more than two hundred now young delegates who are engaged um, in testing, say DD step questions, or uh, helping to uh, give feedback to uh, programs that the AGA is putting on. And so, I would strongly encourage that you, if you have any interest, to um, uh, to to look up the young delegates program on the AGA website and consider uh, signing up. There's also uh, a GI Ford, uh, Forging Ford um, uh, cyber seminar kind of series that is talking about how to deal with um, kind of leadership and other problems during the area, uh, era of COVID. Excuse me, uh, started uh, several months ago and it's ongoing. Another um, really interesting program, the AGA podcast, Small uh, Talk, Big uh, Topics, is actually starting tomorrow. And it features uh, uh, three hosts, 
Um, one is a current GI fellow, one is a, um, someone in, um, in practice, and someone else who is a uh, program director and also former radio DJ. I just heard kind of a snippet of uh, what the topics they've been talking about. It sounds really, really interesting. So I uh, uh, encourage you to, uh, you know, uh, download it and uh, kind of take a listen because I think it will be uh, really cool. Um, and lastly, I just wanted to uh, mention that the um, all everything that we're talking about today, uh, this will be recorded at AGA University, and you can also go to AGA University Education to look at a lot of other um, offerings um, that are put on by the AGA. Um, we have, um, you know, the new gastroenterologist, which is a um, publication dedicated to the new gastroenterologist, so young gastroenterologist, and a lot of, um, um, you know, board exam prep uh, uh, resources like DDSEP, AGA Board Review, GI SAM, GastroCards app, etc. cetera. Um, so with that, I think that is my um, last slide. I'll turn it back to uh, Fisher. Well, Bisher, you're muted. I apologize. I was on mute. Uh, this is one of the uh, problems with uh, this system. But uh, so what I was saying is now we're going to pass it on to Dr. Uh, Kim and Weinstein. Uh, Larry, I think you go first. Yeah. So Michael and I uh, are really pleased to be here tonight to share with you some of our perspectives on uh, a career in community-based uh, GI practice. Um, I'm going to start off our presentation and then uh, turn it over to Michael. So next slide, please. So I think that there are three main attractions to the independent GI practice model. Um, the first is stability. Uh, when I was in training, I watched my role models, my mentors uh, move from institution to institution uh, very commonly in search of the next great career opportunities. Uh, but in contrast, as I mentioned earlier, I'm still in the first job I've ever had. And after 20 plus years, I can say that when I go to clinic, uh, quite often I see patients whom I've known for years. I've seen their parents, their kids, sometimes even their grandkids. And so uh, seeing patients like this really is almost like visiting with old friends often. And it really makes for a much different and really satisfying doctor-patient relationship. Uh, second is control. Um, as an owner of a GI operation, you have direct input into how you practice. You can control your work-life balance, how many patients you see, what kind of schedule you keep. You can also control your practice style, what type of patients you see. And as practices become larger and more sophisticated, many actually encourage subspecialization. At South Denver GI, for example, out of 24 physicians, we have hepatologists, advanced endoscopists, motility and IBD experts. And although you may still see plenty of general GI, having a niche within the field uh, really can add greatly uh, to your career satisfaction. And then finally, entrepreneurship. Um, independent practices these days really are laboratories for vertical integration, business expansion. Of course, most practices develop and endos uh, operate endoscopy centers, but we're also growing into new business lines from pathology, infusion centers, even wellness and obesity management. Really, I'd say the horizon is limited only by your vision, your creativity, and your ability to see things through. Uh, next slide. Uh, so as I mentioned, I'm still enjoying my first job, uh, but it is crucial to choose that job wisely. So these are just some, some ideas about how to do that. So first and foremost, make sure that the philosophy of the practice fits your vision for your career. Uh, beyond that, just like real estate, location, location, location. This is where you hope to raise your family. Make sure that they're going to be happy there. The reputation of the group, both in terms of clinical excellence as well as business acumen, really are key factors that you should investigate as much as you can through multiple channels. How decisions are made in the group is going to be crucial to having that control over your professional life that I was alluding to. What kind of say do you have as a partner? The best groups will actually also respect your input as an associate. And then finally, what kind of outside opportunities does the group afford? 
My ability to be with you today is because my practice values investment in the community and actually allows me protected time to volunteer for our professional societies. Next slide. Most doctors in private practice divide their time primarily between office visits and endoscopy. The exact allocations you know, will vary and you may be able to control this to some degree based upon your own preferences. The use of ancillary staff is also increasing. This maximizes your efficiency by unloading as much busy work as possible and may allow you to spend more time performing endoscopy if that's your wish. Practices vary in how they allocate administrative time. Some will also allow protected time for activities such as research or volunteerism, as I mentioned. And although most of the work in community GI practice is outpatient, almost all groups will have some degree of hospital coverage. How this is handled also varies significantly. The most common model is to share coverage across, across all providers, but increasingly practices with heavy inpatient volumes are hiring dedicated GI hospitalists. And this represents another potential career path. Next slide. Uh, you probably know uh, that many hospital uh, and integrated health systems around the country are very interested in hiring their own captive gastroenterologists. Such jobs are easy to find and offer enticing compensation packages. But in general, uh, independent practice offers higher long-term earnings potential and significantly more autonomy and control both of which tend to be nearly non-existent as a hospital employee. Uh, the disadvantages are the administrative burden of running a practice, although this is mitigated significantly in the larger groups. And of course, there is a potential risk associated with buying into a business. Uh, so I will be happy, Michael and I will both be happy to answer any questions you might have about private practice, but uh, now I'll turn it over to Michael to finish uh, our portion of the presentation. Uh, thank you, Larry. Um, again, I'm uh, very uh, happy to uh, speak with uh, you and provide some guidance. I was, uh, as uh, Larry said, I was very fortunate when I went into practice to have uh, excellent mentors uh, who provided uh, me most of my background in uh, bus the business of medicine. Um, uh, you can go to the, the next slide. Uh, but when you think of independent private practice, there are different forms of independent practice depending upon the group and the location that you're looking at. So single specialty is maybe the most common, um, but even within single specialty now, you have to uh, inquire about whether or not the, the practice is part of a private equity model, whether they're completely owned by the physicians, and you wanna understand what the governance structure is of the practice. Do the physicians really get to decide uh, what type of schedule they have and how they want to run their offices? Uh, Larry mentioned uh, different service lines and ancillary uh, opportunities. Uh, independent physicians do generally have a higher long-term earning capacity ca capability than um, uh, hospital-based and uh, academic-based, but it is, it is relative to taking advantage of the opportunity to provide a complete array of digestive uh, care, including endoscopy centers, anatomic pathology, anesthesia services, infusion services. These all now make up part of the modern independent GI practice. Um, if you're talking to a group, you do wanna try and understand uh, how income is divided amongst the group. Is it a equal split? Is it a productivity basis? Uh, an important question to ask if you're talking to an independent group. What parts of the uh, practice do, are in-house? What parts do they outsource as far as the business management of the group? How much business management are you going to have to do as a new associate in a group? Will most of that back office uh, work be taken care of by uh, um, uh, management people? Or are the physicians responsible for basically managing the whole practice? In a multi-specialty group, there are some advantages. Um, there is certainly payer leverage in most communities in multi-specialty groups. 
Um, and obviously, the, you have captured the referral base. The internists in a multi-specialty group will tend to be your referral base. That uh, makes it a little bit easier to build a practice. And you also have the opportunity to uh, have a multidisciplinary approach to the more complex patients because uh, physicians in other specialties are actually part of your own group. But again, one of the issues in uh, multi-specialty groups is how do they divide the income? My analogy for uh, multi-specialty groups and some of the troubles that they've had is similar to a zoo. Um, when you put all the different animals in one cage, they tend to fight over the food. And it's always a bit of a competition between the specialties to decide how they're going to divide the income. You can, uh, you can go to the next uh, slide. So you'll see, uh, and I'm sure you've, if you've been doing any reading about uh, healthcare delivery and medical practice across the United States, there is a huge drive to practice consolidation, not just in gastroenterology, but also in other specialties. And there's a reason for that. The, the complexity of medical practice, the business complexity has made it very difficult for small groups to continue to exist, given the issues related to information technology, contracting, uh, prior authorization, and a lot of the uh, paperwork issues that physicians are really not trained to do. So consolidation is happening at a, at a uh, rapid rate. And to some extent, I think COVID has actually driven some additional practice consolidation. Um, but there are advantages to being in a bigger and bigger group being able to subspecialize, as Larry mentioned, and to have that efficiency uh, of a very uh, robust back office. And within a community, a larger group obviously can be more relevant, have a, a dominance, um, and, the, and you can take advantage of some of the opportunities with consumerism, social media, uh, advertising, and things that smaller groups would have trouble taking advantage of. Uh, next slide. Um, uh, I, we wanted to just uh, bring your attention. We did a uh, DHPA, if you're not familiar, is an uh, advocacy association that started about six or seven years ago of independent uh, gastroenterology practices. There's now 95 practices, and we did a quick survey. And when I say quick, this survey went out less than a week ago, and within the week, 29 practices responded. And we asked them how many new associates they were going to be thinking of hiring within the next year and up to the next five years. So you can see there's a huge need for uh, new associates in almost every GI group across the country, uh, partly because uh, if you're not aware, gastroenterology tends to be an older specialty by average age. And I think with COVID and things, there's been sort of a, uh, an idea that maybe uh, physicians may retire a little bit early, and this will create quite a demand for uh, new associates in the independent groups. Um, next, next slide. Uh, last slide. So uh, just some final comments and experience of over 30 years in practice. I can guarantee you that pretty much no matter where you go, if you join an independent practice, their intention and hopefully your desire is to be busy. Busy means your days will be full, your income will be generous, you'll make a very reasonable living. But a private practice is hardly private. Uh, patients will bother you, staff will bother you, partners will bother you. There will be many reasons that people will be uh, uh, talking to you, uh, maybe a little bit more so than uh, academic practice. Uh, in, as Larry said, there's lots of opportunities to um, uh, go to lectures and to, tr to be part of meetings. Someday we'll travel again for meetings and you'll have lots of opportunities to learn the business of medicine if that's your desire. But I, I, will, I would be remiss if I didn't make the last point. I give a talk occasionally of the 10 things I wish I hadn't done uh, in practice. And after 35 years, it's hard to cut it down to 10. But one of the things I would remind all of you is that no matter which job you seek, and which job you eventually uh, 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 take, just remember that they're, uh, given all these chances that you have to change your career and, and participate in all these other things, you only have one chance to raise your children. I 
tell you, don't miss it, because you, you cannot do that over again. You only get one chance to do that. So I wish you all the best. I think Larry and I are certainly available. We can, can If you have a location in mind and you're thinking about independent practice, you can contact Larry or, or I, and uh, you, we will hook you up with somebody in that location who is probably looking for an associate. So thank you. I, I appreciate your time listening to us, and I'll allow uh, this to move along. Thanks very much, Larry and Michael. Uh, next uh, segment, uh, Dr. Vera is going to kick things off. Kim? Yes, thanks very much. If I could have the next slide, please. So, um, so our brief is to tell you a little bit about the other side of this, which is academic uh, careers. And I'm going to take the perspective of a PhD basic scientist. Um, I've had a very satisfying career in a GI division in a medical school. But whether you want to stay in academia or move beyond, there's just such a huge array of possible positions. So um, you can look for a tenure track position in a basic science department if you're a sort of GI uh, PhD um, that could be either inside or outside of a medical school setting. Um, you might, as I did, choose to make your career in a clinical department as a basic scientist, and that's certainly very viable. There's lots of pros and cons to weigh up between these different settings and different types of institutions. If you're in a basic science department outside of a medical school, you're likely to have a lot of teaching. Um, on the other hand, it's, uh, some or all of your salary may be covered by so-called hard money, and you won't be expected to raise your salary from extramural funds or other things that you might do. Um, in a medical school setting, you're usually gonna be expected to raise some or all of your salary but you're gonna have a lot less teaching um, than your colleagues across the street in the biology department. So it's really just a question of weighing up your risk tolerance and what you wanna spend your time doing. There are many other research-based uh, opportunities in academia, um, whether you don't want to run your own show and want to be part of a larger um, team science group, or indeed, if you think that some kind of administrative opportunity might be appealing to you. So there's lots of opportunities in sort of research administration where you can use your research acumen to help others move their careers forward. Or you could run core facilities or, 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 or the like. There are also these days with a PhD, very many opportunities outside of academia, um, lots of jobs in industry, both large and small, um, positions in the, in the government, federal government, and then opportunities in science policy and grant making. So uh, currently, as I said, I'm at the National Science Foundation overseeing a portfolio of about $300 million in grant awards. And um, it's really fun to spend time um, uh, making awards to other scientists. Next slide, please. So how do you prepare yourself for this array of uh, career options for basic scientists? You still need to develop your niche. Um, it's important to be known as an expert in something. Um, and that's, uh, I think, a most important thing to take away from your training. Um, and if you have uh, the ability to, you should try and seek out opportunities to experience the key facets of your chosen path so that you'll really have a sense if, if it's something that you're gonna enjoy doing for the rest of your career. So if there's some specific technical approach that you wanna use um, uh, down the road in your lab, you might consider a second postdoc. If you see teaching as being part of your career, you can look for opportunities within, within your institution. Or sometimes if those are not available, you might be able to go to the local community college, for example. Certainly if you're going to aspire to a teaching intensive job, they're gonna to want to have some sense that you know how to teach. Um, it's possible to pursue internships in industry and other settings. And there's quite a few fellowship programs um, if you're interested in getting into government or policy work, such as the AAAS Science and Technology Policy Fellowships, We're actually, which are actually quite well paid and can introduce you to work in the federal government or beyond. Um, it's really important when you're still in a mentored phase, if your goal is to have an independent research career, 
that you talk about your project portability with your mentor, and maybe you're working on more than one project to um, to sort of spread your um, wings a little bit, but having that conversation early so that there's no nasty surprises when you're ready to move out into an independent career is really important. And then if you are seeking um, an academic position, either on the tenure track or in some other format, um, you really want to acquire the coin of the realm. And I see that I have a wonderful typo here <laughs> of substantive first authored publications, quality versus quality. It's not really a typo because you want to focus on quality uh, papers. Um, this is much more impressive to hiring committees than a large number of less lower quality um, brief papers that without detailed mechanisms where you're one of many, many authors. And then if you have the opportunity um, seeking out grants on which you can perhaps serve as the PI is also very compelling to search committees for tenure track positions. Next slide, please. And my key takeaways are that, first of all, many jobs are not advertised. Um, you can fashion your own destiny. If you're applying for a tenure track position in a biology department, there may be a formal search, but you may find that you can fashion a position for yourself even in the environment uh, where you're training. Um, you should consider what represents success for you and identify role models who can advise you if they're outside of the wheelhouse of your mentor. We train postdocs in academia, but that may not be where you want to go. So um, finding ways to understand uh, the job description is really important. And don't let yourself be um, uh, uh, feel pressured into just becoming a clone of your mentor if you know that that's not what is not what will make you satisfied in your career. And a way to um, gather this additional um, uh, insights is really to embrace mentoring programs. And uh, we all need multiple mentors. So this is a way to get diverse perspectives. And then uh, the final key takeaway for me as a lifelong introvert is network, network, network. You can never meet too many people. Um, attend meetings, uh, especially when we get back to doing this in person, but even virtually, even if it feels uncomfortable to come up and speak to people that you don't actually know, um, you've got to push yourself out there. My PhD advisor told me um, that I definitely would have to put myself about a bit, which is a soccer term in the UK, if I wanted to be successful in my career. And I took that to heart. And that is one thing that's really helped me. And now I'm going to hand this over to uh, Nick Davidson, who's going to talk about physician scientists. Thanks, Kim. Um, and uh, just let me say, Kim is um, the quintessential uh, lifelong mentor. Um, so thank you, Kim. Um, so I'm going to be talking to the uh, small number of you who are physician scientists in training. Um, to outline some of the issues that I think are important um, as you consider um, building a career as a basic researcher. So for those of you who are, um, you know, in your first year or even in your second year of GI fellowship, um, who have identified that you want to have a career as a basic researcher, um, the the uh, among the most important things um, uh, that I tell our trainees, um, embrace your clinical training and, in, and acquire all the clinical skills that you're gonna need. Um, the, you will be expected as a faculty member to be able to participate as a functioning um, clinical GI consultant. So there's no short tracking um, or bypassing um, any of those uh, um, rotations, really important that you do that. Um, as you're thinking about um, a career as a basic researcher, it's helpful to decide on uh, subspecialty interests. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about this in the next slide. Um, uh, it isn't necessary that you have a subspecialty interest, um, but um, it can certainly help to align your clinical and research uh, interests if you do have one. 
And then you need to start thinking and planning for faculty transition. Even as a second year GI fellow, you need to be strategic in planning out what the milestones and objectives are so that you can um, optimize your career development. Next slide, please. So um, these are some of the reasons why clinical training is so important. Um, number one, um, as a basic research faculty member, it is really important that you are viewed as part of the community of academic clinical scholars. Um, it's important to be part of that community because basic research in 2020 and, and moving forwards is increasingly a translational dialogue. So you will need your clinical partners to be engaged. They need to see you as respecting what they do. Secondly, you need to be visible to medical students, residents, and, and GI fellows. They all need to see you as a viable clinical gastroenterologist or hepatologist or IBDologist or whatever it is you decide to be. Um, Third, and this is sort of building on what I said at the beginning, you need to respect the importance of clinical programs. Those clinical programs drive clinical and basic research questions. The advances to the unmet needs in terms of the clinical questions will come from the basic research lab uh, and there needs to be a dialogue back and forth. And that can only happen if you are viewed as part of that continuum. And then um, frankly, it builds cohesion and aligns the mission, the teaching, research, and patient care mission across the division. Very important. Next slide, please. So deciding on a subspecialty. So like I said, it's not, it's not essential, but see, here are some of the considerations. So some clinical niche areas are well aligned with a career as a basic scientist. So IBD, um, is currently, you know, that's the poster child for um, uh, the interface in mucosal immunology, um, the gut microbiome, um, inflammatory mediators, and disease manifestations. If you want to do IBD, you need to be firmly embedded um, in mucosal immunology. Neurogastroenterology, um, studying neurotransmitters, um, uh, and, and uh, understanding um, you know, the importance of functional GI disorders. And in hepatology, um, obesity and non-alcoholic fatty liver disease are the burgeoning epidemics of the 21st century. Um, secondly, um, it's important to understand the culture of the institution that you're at uh, or where you want to be. So for example, um, if you want to be a physician scientist at Washington University, you would have 20% clinical effort. So, um, if you want to, to be uh, an IBD subspecialist, you would have you know, a half day clinic for uh, inflammatory bowel disease and maybe some limited inpatient um, time on the clinical services, but not a whole lot more. It's important to identify role models with similar time and effort. Um, uh, people who, do, who are doing and are successful at what you want to do. So that is really important um, as you look at the culture of the institution and uh, identifying mentors. And then it's also important that you align your compensation expectations in line with clinical effort. If you're gonna be doing 20% clinical effort, your compensation is gonna be considerably less than somebody who is doing 75 or 80% clinical time. Next slide, please. So planning your faculty transition. Do you stay at your current institution or do you consider other opportunities? When is the time to do that? Well, it's probably a continuous discussion. Um, uh, um, within our system, we like to encourage um, our trainees uh, to view their training as a three to five year process. So three years of GI fellowship and at least another one to two or, or more years uh, as an instructor so that they can um, 
uh, establish a trajectory of first author high impact publications and begin to apply for grants. As you're considering other opportunities, you need to think about what are the elements of a startup package? What does that look like? How much protected time? How much indemnification for your clinical effort? Um, what is the environment like? Um, have others been successful doing what you project you're gonna be doing? What's the history uh, and legacy of mentorship at your home institution or at other institutions? How much protected time are you gonna have? Um, and what's, like I said before, what has been the track record? You need to understand what the institutional expectations are in terms of the tracks. So is there a dedicated tenure accruing track or is there a one track system where everybody's tenure accruing? What are the criteria for promotion and advancement and how is the tenure clock managed? Let me give you an example. So at our institution, if you are an instructor in medicine, your tenure clock does not begin. When you get promoted to assistant professor, your tenure clock begins and you have eight years um, to be advanced to associate professor with tenure. You need to understand that at different institutions because it will be different. And then you need to plan your strategy and timing for career development awards and other extramural grants. Next slide. And this is my last slide. So these are the key takeaway points. Acquire and maintain skills as both a physician and scientist, really important. Consider trying to align your clinical and scientific interests. Important to cultivate collaborations and networking opportunities. I agree completely with what Kim said, cannot be overstated. Understand your institutional culture and philosophy. That's um, very important for your durable success. And then just know that AGA offers lifelong opportunities for mentoring and for career development. And I would be happy to answer questions. So thanks. I'm gonna hand it over to Lynn. Thanks, Nick. I'm gonna talk uh, more about uh, academia with a clinical career. And it really is a spectrum. So on one, on one end of the spectrum, you have clinician investigators. And these are individuals that have some clinical practice, but they really spend the majority of their time dedicated to research, often doing a clinical human research studies, translational research, or health services. And where many of the clinician educators are aspiring or have been successful uh, being uh, f um, PIs or co-investigators of a federal grant, like a National Institutes of, of Health uh, grant. Then we have this hybrid clinician researcher that seems to be dwindling a little more. Um, and that, that's where an individual has relatively equal amounts of clinical practice and clinical research. Often they're a PI or co-investigator of clinical trials. They have investigator initiated studies, uh, foundation or society grants. Um, the types of studies that this individual usually does is prospective human studies. Um, it's really important to collaborate with a group of um, primary researchers because often you can provide uh, patients to, to those, uh, those science teams also providing human samples and clinical data. Uh, often uh, you do database studies, systematic reviews, and meta-analyses. And then on the other end of the spectrum, you have clinician educators who are in academia. And those are physicians that predominantly do clinical practice. They do also do teaching and they have a little bit of research. Now these uh, physicians are gonna have higher income than the clinician investigators because the clinician, invest clinician investigators do much less clinical practice. And a lot of their income is based on what um, money they can bring in from grants, where the clin clinician educators is going to be based on um, their RVUs from patient care and um, endos endoscopy. I think these are actually an older set of slides. You can go to the next uh, slide. Um, and then there's also clinical research opportunities in a non-academic setting and and Kim touched on this, there's government positions at the NIH, Center for Disease Control or Department of Defense, they do research. In industry for clinical research, uh, physicians can get a job in industry, work in research and development, uh, where you do uh, more uh, human studies like phase one trials and early development of uh, drug and device. For the clinical development 
uh, section of industry, they do phase two and phase three trials. And in medical affairs, they design post-marketing studies. So that's after the device or the drug has uh, been given regulatory approval. And of course you can be uh, primarily in a GI practice and do clinical trials. So a lot of GI practices have very uh, robust clinical trial operations. And in fact, many of the clinical trials that you see, a lot of the patients are recruited from GI practices, and actually less from uh, universities. Next slide. So in training though, uh, these are the things that you have to think about. So for clinician investigators, as you know, the ACGME requires that all GI fellows get 18 months of clinical training. But for those who wanna be primarily clinical researchers, you're going to have a 75 protected time. So usually in some part of your fellowship, usually your second and third year, and maybe a fourth year, you'll have 75% 75, 75 protected time to get more additional training and mentorship. Often uh, GI fellows are getting a master's degree or sometimes a PhD degree in clinical research, like say health services research. Uh, there's T32 training grants, um, and also NURSA and other types of um, mentoring programs that provide salary support. Uh, the CTSI will have a KL2 uh, uh, program, which is career development for clinical and translational research. Now for clinical fellows, they often get a very little clinical uh, research time and they really don't have as much time to do some in-depth type of research, but uh, fellows are required to have a scholarly activity and that's usually some research project. And often just because of the time that a, a GI fellow has, they usually do a chart review, QI project, surveys, database project, or sometimes a prospective study if they can. Um, but I think it's really important for clinical fellows to get research training, even if they don't go in a primarily research type of uh, faculty position, because it's really important to, uh, to um, have the uh, skills and the understanding of research because it helps you to be more critical in the way you look at the literature and how you run your practice, or even if you wanna do some amount of clinical research. Um, and so I think it's really important to, to plan on how you're going to have protected research time. If you wanna have a academic job where you're gonna do primarily research, I think uh, sometimes fellows think they're going to be able to give, be given protected time as a faculty member. And often that's not the case unless you've had the training or there is a plan to support you while you're getting a grant. Next slide. So I had some key takeaways. There's really a range of clinical research opportunities in academia and also in non-academic settings. I really do think it's important as a GI fellow, if you're thinking at all that you would wanna do a primarily clinical research career, it's really important to plan during your fellowship. And in the past, a lot of times people did not get a master's degree or PhD, but that really seems to be more of what people are doing in the modern era. And I think it really is advantage to do that if that's offered to you. Uh, but it's so much harder to have mainly clinical training, even going into a clinical job and then trying to go back into academia where you wanna do more research. I think if you really wanna do research, you should really focus on that in your fellowship and then get a uh, primarily clinical research job with some patient care. I think it's important to self-reflect on what kind of job you want. You wanna really consider personal and practical issues. It's important to select a research niche that you think will be funded and is addressing any knowledge gaps and something that you're passionate and interested in. And it's important to set priorities, um, discuss your career plan with uh, many of those around you. And it's really important, as everyone said before, is to have mentors and to find these mentors during your training and afterwards. And you can have many different types of mentors. You can have research mentors, career development, work-life balance. Um, but I, I do think for research even is to have multiple uh, mentors and they don't have to be just in GI, they can be outside of GI. That's it. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, to all the speakers, the panelists, uh, great presentations. Uh, so it looks like we have a lot of questions, which is fantastic. And we've already asked and all the panelists have uh, kindly agreed to stay on. So we plan to stay on till somewhere between 8.40 and 8.45, uh, as long as not people don't uh, start dropping off because there's some really good, great questions that have come up. Some of the questions have already been answered. 
So I'm going to start with uh, one question, and this actually is addressed to all the panelists, but I just need one sentence or less for an answer. Uh, and the question is, can uh, each of you comment on the single factor that made you pick whatever career you've chosen? You don't have to elaborate why you picked it, but, but what was it? What was that factor? So I, I'm looking at uh, Larry first, and then I'm just going to go uh, um, around uh, the panel. Um, I decided uh, fairly early on that I wanted to have a career in one place. I wanted to watch my kids grow up um, and uh, I wanted to have patients that I, that I got to know really well. So that's what I was able to achieve. And like I said, I'm still on the first job that I ever had and very happy to be here. Uh, Lynn. Uh, I would say that to know yourself and pick something that you're interested and passionate about. I think that is how people succeed. If they're doing something they really love, um, that they're more successful. Michael. Uh, you might be muted, Michael. All right. Yeah, um, I agree with Larry. Um, by the time I finished my fellowship, uh, I already had uh, one child, one on the way. My wife had lots of friends. It was very important to try and stay in the same location. So for me, it was a location, location, location. <laughs> uh, Nick. But you guys are all so mature and developed. <laughs> it was totally random. Um, you know, I, I was lucky to have good mentors and I enjoyed what I was doing. So I just kept doing it. Uh, Kim and then Peter. Um, I think for me, it's that no two days would ever be the same. And that I, I saw that I would be able to do so many different things over the course of my career. Uh, Peter, you might be muted. There you go. Um, yes, for me, I think um, it would be, um, I think following kind of my passion. Um, so I'm a clin uh, clinical uh, investigator. Uh, so to be able to have that uh, balance, um, to be able to both see patients as well as pursue my uh, research interests. Yeah, for me, it was really, uh, I ended up uh, moving. I didn't even know I was going to go into medicine, uh, but I, it was really following my passion. So I ended up changing uh, 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 directions uh, just for the passion. Uh, that was a key one. So um, one question here in terms of, uh, this is for both Larry and Michael. Uh, if I'm in private practice, I start working uh, three, five years, and then uh, how, do, how if I want to transition, somehow I'm not too happy, there might be some other issues. Uh, how, do, how possible is it to transition from one private practice group to another? If you can uh, be brief. Larry, do you want to take that one first? Uh, sure. Um, yes, you can transition. I think a key factor is the time horizon or the time point at which you do that, once you have bought into a practice, you know, so practices are businesses, you invest in them as a partner. So once you've invested in a practice and bought in, it does make it a little more complicated getting out. You know, you have to be bought out. Um, uh, but I'll also let Michael weigh in as well. Yeah, I think um, there are a couple of issues. One, certainly if there's a need to move, a spouse gets a job, um, obviously, I think in a, in a practice, there's going to be an opportunity to move. And I think the buy-in and the buy-out are issues you handle early on. So that's not going to be a restriction. I think as far as changing groups within the same city, changing groups within the same city, that's going to be a little bit more difficult. Um, there, uh, and that's probably even true in some of the academic practices. There are restrictive covenants as to where you can move because of the competition issues. Um, in our practice, we do we have allowed people to leave our practice to join academic settings in the same city. We didn't we didn't consider that competitive, and we've allowed people to become academic uh, physicians even uh, from private practice back into academia. Thanks so much. So here's another one. This is for the group. Uh, short answers, please. Uh, it says here you're, uh, all of us um, are considered tr uh, having trained in top tier programs. Uh, any recommendations on how to modify job uh, search expect uh, expectation when coming from less quote unquote and uh, name recognized uh, institutions? 
pick. Are you calling on people or you want yes. people to chime uh, in? Uh, go ahead, Larry. Go ahead. You start it first. You chime uh, in. I took a stab on this, a stab at this one also online or on the chat feature. But, um, you know, our group hires, I think any large group hires based on the person. Where they come from helps open the door, but it's certainly not the be all and end all. And one thing I tried to highlight is increasingly um, personal connections are really critical. You know, um, personal connections and also the fit, you know, philosophically uh, with the practice and how you come off. Uh, personal connections, you know, the GI community is small and people tend to know each other. And usually in any a group, uh, at least in private practice, a group of any significant size will have you know, somebody that knows one of your mentors and we'll talk to them before we hire you. So that's gonna be critical. Uh, thank you, Larry. So let me uh, throw, uh, I'm gonna throw another question here. Um, uh, now this question was already answered by Michael. So uh, Michael, you answered with a paragraph. I'm gonna ask the panelists to answer with one sentence. Uh, uh, so if you're in the chat room, you can take a look at Michael's answer. It's, it's actually quite, uh, uh, quite detailed and very helpful, but this is a, uh, for the rest, what is the biggest thing you consider uh, before signing your first job, whatever that job is? When you took your first job, what was it that you thought about? Uh, what, or how would you, knowing what you know now, maybe you should be thinking about other things. How, how would you advise your, uh, your, your uh, cousin, your, your neighbor uh, to answer this question? So uh, Michael answered this, so I'm gonna go, let, let me start with Peter. Uh, you took a job already, what, what, what did you, what was the first thing you thought about? Yeah, so I also responded in the Q and A, but I think uh, for me is to make sure that um, the most important aspects of the job are really, you know, detailed, written down, um, uh, ideally in the contract. But if that's not the case, um, the least document is some type of writing uh, over email, or whatnot, because it's much like with patient care. I think if it's not documented, then it doesn't really count. Okay, I'm going to go to Lynn, Nick, and then uh, Kim. Uh, Lynn. I think at the age that we're at our first job, you really think about your family um, and more of the personal aspects and where you wanna live and where your family wants to live. I think this, having that support is really important. I would also say it would be nice for it to be the job that you want, but sometimes it's not the perfect job for you and you move on later on to another job that's maybe a little more perfect. Uh, Nick? I think it's important uh, that your expectations are aligned with the uh, expectations of the institution. So uh, speaking to Peter's point, I think having uh, explicit delineation of your clinical expectations, inpatient, backup endoscopy time, um, and details of a startup package, making sure that it's fair and aligned with, with what others have gotten and, and what you expect just transparency. Thank you. Uh, Kim. Yeah, and appropriate for this group, trust your gut. If something <laughs> doesn't feel right, it's probably not. And this is when you use your, um, your networking to really do your due dil diligence with other people in the department, other people around the department to find out what it's really like to work there. Thank you. So here's a question now to uh, both uh, Larry and uh, Michael. Uh, you're involved in uh, community practice, uh, medium to large size groups. How, how do you find the time? How do you get involved in the AGA in the first place? Uh, what, what, what's, uh, uh, what, what, what happened? Larry and then Michael. Um, I don't know. I, I, I don't know how to say no. So the more you say yes, the more people keep asking you to do stuff. Um, I also tried to take a stab at this uh, in writing, but, you know, I, I would just say if you're interested in this kind of stuff, keep volunteering. You know, a lot of the stuff that is available to do is, is small. It's, it doesn't take a lot of time. You can do it on your own time and uh, uh, just keep staying involved and uh, opportunities will definitely come. Yeah, I, I would echo that. I think if you want to be involved, you're, if you're joining an independent group, they will be perfectly happy to allow you to be involved, including finding the time for you to be on committees. And it used to be traveling, but right now, obviously, it's not traveling for committee meetings. It's all Zoom anyway. Um, I was lucky. I was living in Bethesda. I can walk to AGA headquarters. So for me, it was very easy to be involved at AGA. It has been sort of a second home for me for 30 years. 
Yeah, so uh, now uh, same question, uh, you know, to uh, Kim, Nick, uh, Lynn, and Peter, in terms of, uh, uh, if you can very briefly highlight the importance of being involved in a national or slash international organization. Uh, how have, have how have you benefited from this? We have a lot of uh, fellows or, uh, you know, scientists on the call. Uh, what would you advise them about uh, wh why this is really so important? Briefly, Kim. Um, first of all, it's fun. Second, you meet lots of people who might end up being research collaborators or at least friends. Third of all, if you're in academia, it counts. You have to do some kind of service and you might as well do it for such a wonderful organization as the AGA. I'm gonna go with Nick then, and then Peter. Nick? Building a community um, is a survival strategy. Networking is essential. Um, and it will amplify both your clinical uh, capacity as well as your research interests. Lynn and then Peter. Yeah, I think you just learn so much more than what you learn on your day-to-day -day job about so many different aspects about medicine and career. And I think the other thing that has helped me a lot is uh, I've learned uh, leadership skills by being involved in uh, different organizations. And that's been really great. Peter. Yeah, I'd like to echo um, what everyone just said. I think, you know, the ability to meet people who you otherwise may never meet um, is just so exciting. And um, to be able to network with those people, um, who knows what kind of doors that may open for you um, down the line. And also, I just want to point out in the in the answer QA part, I just put down um, also for uh, people who are maybe interested in the Young Delegates Program, I have a link there if you want to um, join and sign up. Yeah, I mean, I just want to, obviously, this might sound like a commercial for AGA, but uh, uh, I'm AGA president. So, uh, I mean, the AGA is just, uh, I'm telling you this from the bottom of my heart, the AGA is a fantastic organization. There's so many opportunities. It doesn't matter whether you're uh, a fellow, you're a scientist, uh, postdoc, looking for career opportunities, uh, whether you're advancing through your career, mid-career level, there, there are so many opportunities uh, to participate uh, in the AGA. But uh, if... Uh, so stick with an one or two organizations. And if you're on the scientist side, uh, I, don't, I would be interested in what uh, Kim, for example, Nick and Lynn think, but uh, being involved in a more basic science organization and also a, a, if your research has any translational clinical component, also being involved in a clinical organization like the AGA, for example, um, uh, I personally think, uh, this is what I usually uh, advise, but I wonder your opinion about this. Um, I, I would agree. If you're a PhD, it's important to have a basic science home as well. And for me, that's been the American Physiological Society, but also the Physiological Society of the UK. Um, it's not that there aren't physician scientists in those organizations as well, but it, it just brings you to your core scientific discipline in a way that isn't necessarily so easy to get um, from the AGA. But it's been really important for me to be involved in both societies. Uh, Nick, uh, yeah. Oh. Yeah, um, yeah, I don't really have much to add. I think, you know, participating in multiple societies um, and creating, you know, uh, not necessarily overlapping networks of collaborators um, has been really helpful for me. So the AGA is, you know, is a big welcoming umbrella. Um, but um, that doesn't mean that there aren't other opportunities that you should pursue as well. So, you know, um, building this network of friends and collaborators and mentors has been really pivotal for me personally. Lynn. Yeah, I was just going to add, I, I agree with, with everything uh, that Kim and Nick said. I, I, I do think it's really important to understand the basic translational clinical aspect. I think that actually makes your research better and more relevant if you understand that and just attending lectures outside of your own niche is, is I think really important. So uh, we have just a couple uh, more finished concluding slides, a uh, few informationals. Uh, now there might be some additional, if there's any additional questions, what we'll try to do is answer in uh, our AGA community. And another uh, reminder is that uh, this is being uh, videotaped. Uh, so you can watch the entire presentation if, you, if, you, uh, if there are certain aspects of it that you think are helpful, you wanna pass it along to some of your colleagues, uh, they can access it and uh, you don't uh, have to be an AGA member to have access to some of the information that's available in AGA uh, University. So um, uh, 
or this was already mentioned. I just want to uh, 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 just remind you about this. Uh, I think it's going to be really a very helpful uh, webinar in terms of how to evaluate a job in 2021. The moderators are going to be both Peter and uh, Nicole, and uh, the, 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 the uh, uh, panelist uh, is going to be John Allen, who's at the University of Michigan. Has a, he has tons of experience experience in private practice. Then moving on now, he's in uh, at the University of Michigan. So and he was past president of the AG. Um, so they picked a great speaker. Next slide, please. And uh, uh, also, Peter, I just want to remind you about this. This sounds really, really cool. Uh, it's probably going to get more uh, listeners than what we had on this uh, on this webinar. I want to certainly uh, listen to it myself. So that's uh, tomorrow. And uh, uh, Jessica Duncan, I think, sent the link to this uh, on, on the uh, uh, chat um, uh, box. So uh, hopefully uh, all of you will be able to uh, listen to it and also pass it along to your uh, uh, friends. Uh, next slide. And uh, so I mentioned at the top of uh, this webinar that this is uh, the third uh, town hall uh, that uh, had the privilege uh, to uh, uh, work with the, the team at the AHA to organize. The next one is going to be uh, either in December or January. We're aiming for December. Uh, as soon as we have a date uh, fixed, uh, formed up, we'll, uh, we'll uh, uh, send it out. And it's going to be uh, a meeting uh, uh, folks from the NIH to talk about digestive diseases and nutrition research how that have been impacted by COVID, what's the projection now? Uh, there is some predictions that funding is gonna increase. Uh, is that real or not? Uh, when will that come to fruition? Uh, you know, th those kinds of uh, uh, topics. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, again, I wanna thank each and every one of you for participating in this webinar. I wanna give a shout out to uh, Jessica Duncan and Courtney Reed who kind of were the glue to put all, all, all this together. So uh, that's right. And, um, um, have a wonderful, uh, wishing you and your uh, families and loved ones a uh, uh, wonderful holiday season. Thanksgiving is going to uh, come up. So again, thank you so much. Uh, take care. Thank you, Bisha. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah.